The other topic I want to touch on is friction, okay? Because we just did a problem here where we had a frictionless slot. And in real life, there are some places where frictionless, um, you know, there are some places where frictionless assumptions make sense. Um, there are a lot of cases where frictionless assumptions do not make sense, right? And so being able to deal with these is an important thing as well. So the model, there's multiple models of friction. That's another thing I probably should say, um, is that there's not just one kind of friction. What we're dealing with here is called Coulomb friction, or another word for it is dry friction. You guys are probably some, somewhat familiar with this, because I think you do touch on it in the, in the physics class that uh, you did prior to this class. Um, but we're going to hopefully go a little bit more in depth on this. So. Basically, I guess the first thing I want to mention here is that there are two phases of dry friction. And we'll look at the first one first. You know, in both cases, we're looking at a case, let's say, where we're, we've got a block that's sliding on a surface like this. If I do a little free body diagram of that block, let's say over here like this, um, before the motion starts, what we have is we've got a uh, again, this applied force, I put sub T on there to mention that it's kind of in a tangential direction of the likely direction of motion, right? Um, we are probably going to have some sort of a normal force that's being applied here, at least if this is in a normal gravitational field. Uh, this looks like that surface might be holding up that body. We would often call that a normal force. F sub n is sometimes the variable that I would use for that, okay? And then you have this, uh, you know, force that tends to resist motion, and I'll just show it down here like this. Um, what I want to say is that before motion starts, the value of that force is F sub t, right? Because motion hasn't started yet, and the friction is keeping the motion from starting. And this is a point that gets confused a lot when we talk about the idea of static coefficient of friction versus kinetic coefficient of friction. A lot of times people think that the amount of force that's put in the static coefficient of friction sense can always be calculated with uh, this value of, you know, mu sub s, which is the variable that's often used for uh, static coefficient of friction times F sub n. What I want to say about this is don't make the mistake that that force is always going to be mu sub s times F sub n, right? What this is, is this basically says this will hold F sub t up to a maximum of mu sub s times F sub n, right? In other words, it's going to react whatever you have as your amount of force that's trying to make it move. It'll react to that exact amount of force until you go over a magnitude of mu sub s times F sub n. And then the body will start to move, okay? Once it's in motion, now it's a little bit different story. Once it's in motion, uh, you actually can just say that the amount of resistive force here is going to be equal to mu sub k times F sub n. But that's only once it begins moving, right? So it will now resist with that amount of, uh, of resistive force, OK? Another way to describe this I'll do real quick is what if we look at a uh, chart over time, and we'll say uh, we're looking at forces here on this chart. I could, I could put on this chart a couple of thresholds, or you know, I'll put up here a threshold maybe uh, right about here. Okay, and to kind of be complete, I'll also go to that threshold below, because it doesn't matter what direction you think that you might be moving, okay? 
Now let me, uh, let me kind of illustrate your F, your tangential component of force over time can do a lot of stuff, right? It can kind of have whatever profile you want it to have. And what I want to point out is that whatever profile this does, no motion is happening yet, right? It stays stuck. But what happens if I do this? Okay. At that point, it breaks loose and it will start to move. Okay. So in this range right here, you know, up to this point, no motion, at least not if it wasn't already moving. Right. Right here, motion begins. And so once motion begins, now we're actually kind of curious here to maybe establish something else, and that is how much resistive force is going to apply against the motion. Okay, so I'm going to put this on here, and let me label them too. I didn't label this before. This threshold that I had was my static coefficient of friction times my normal force. Right, and, that, and down here would be minus my static coefficient of friction times my normal force, right? Those are my thresholds there. If I go outside of either of those thresholds, it might start moving, okay? Well, once it starts moving, now what happens if I drop down like this with my amount of force? Okay, does it keep moving? Okay, I would basically, if I'm in that range right there, I would actually say not only do I keep moving, I even keep accelerating. All right, so let's kind of divide that up right there. This is actually accelerating. Why do I know it's accelerating? Basically, I have F sub t at a value higher than mu sub k times F sub n, which means I have a net force in the rightward direction, so it continues to accelerate. What happens if I allow this force to drop below here? And now I'm down here. Now what would you say the, the thing is doing? If it's this block up here that I'm showing. And this, this threshold, I should have put that up here as well. This is mu sub k times f sub n. Okay, if my f sub t, which is my red curve, and that's as a function of t, right? <clears throat> if it does all this, then once I dip below that orange line, then I go down and it starts to decelerate. Okay. Now at this point, I think I've probably had enough acceleration that I probably still have forward velocity so that if I kind of go back up here again, it's probably still moving, right? And so I might start accelerating here again. But what happens now if I drop below again and I stay down here for a ways? At some point, my, my guess is that since you're decelerating all in that region, okay, at some point you would decelerate enough that the part would stop again. All right, so let's say that that happens. Decelerate, 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 and now let's say right here you've had enough deceleration that it comes to rest again. Okay. Well, then what? Can I get it to move again once it comes to rest? Can I get it to move again just by going above the orange? No. I've got to make it go above here again, and then it will move again, okay? Um, one of the, I know this is kind of belaboring the point just a little bit, but I want to really kind of drive home the point 
that the amount of resistive force that you have uh, in the case where there's no motion is just going to be, it's going to resist exactly whatever the applied force is up to a threshold of mu sub s times f sub n, right? After that, then you've got motion and then things are governed by mu sub k times f sub n. If it stops again, though, now you have to have a force that goes back above that threshold in order to get it moving again, okay? That's kind of the big takeaway that I'm trying to illustrate with this picture, okay? All right. Questions? Let's do a problem. Okay. So the spring we have here connects pin A to pin B. There's a spring there that connects pin A, which is attached to that block, to pin B, which is constrained in a slot. Okay. Initially, the spring has no tension in it. So where it's sitting right now, uh, the spring is at rest. It's got no tension in it when it's in the position shown where it has a height of one meter uh, at the connection point A above the slot and a uh, horizontal distance of three meters. The spring constant of the spring is 35 newtons per meter of stretch. And my coefficients of friction are given with 0.4 for my static coefficient of friction and 0.25 for my kinetic coefficient of friction, okay? We're gonna start moving B rightward until the spring stretches enough to get the block moving, okay? And as soon as the block start, starts moving, we're gonna stop moving the pin, right? We're gonna pull it along. As soon as the block stops moving, we'll stop the pin, and then we'll let the block do what it's gonna do, okay? And here's the questions we're going to ask. First of all, uh, how far do we have to move B before uh, block A begins to move? Okay, the second question is, can we figure out the acceleration of block A immediately after it starts moving, right? So the instant that it starts moving immediately after that, what acceleration does it have right at that period of time, right at that point in time? And then C, uh, I wanna know the speed of the block after it has moved for one meter. Okay, so let's get started with this. Part A. What's nice about part A, part A is actually what I would call a quasi-static problem. What do you think I mean by that? Okay. Basically, what I mean by that is we're looking for that threshold in between not moving and moving. There hasn't been any time for there to be an acceleration. There's no movement just yet at this point. And because of that, we can basically solve this problem where acceleration is equal to zero, okay? Which means it is just a statics problem, all right? And so let's do that statics problem. I will. Uh, even though I don't normally do this, I'm going to uh, kind of abstract this block as just a particle because I think it might help us not get too confused with the rotation of the block just yet. All right. Those are interesting problems and we'll get there. But for right now, let's just deal with this as if it's this tiny little thing. Okay. All right. So what kind of forces act on that? Little, little part. Okay, what's an easy one? This is in, this is in gravity, we're, we're back in gravity now, we're not in space anymore. An easy one would be the weight, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and show that up here like this. Uh, the weight is just going to be equal to 10 kilograms times 9.81 meter per second squared, okay, which just gives me 98.1, and that would be Newtons, okay? So far, so good. Then what? Well, we have a normal force being applied like this, 
okay? I don't know what that value is just yet. That one gets a little bit confusing because I also have a force that's being applied from the spring. Okay. And that's my most complicated one of all of them. Let me go ahead and put some axes on here. Let's say that's x and this is y. Okay. Um, so I need to do a couple things here. First of all, how much force the spring applies is a function of how much it stretches, right? How much it changes in length. Okay. So let me actually take a little bit of space up here and draw a little figure that describes some of these things. So we'll start with this figure. We'll start with that point A begins right here. There's a block. Uh, or there's a, a spring then that extends from that block to the initial point for block or for point B. Right? So this is all at the beginning. Okay? The first phase of this problem involves pulling on point B some distance. Okay, and that's actually what we're supposed to find is how far we need to pull that point B in order to get this thing moving. Okay, so this is the new location of B and they just call it B prime. Okay, we're assuming that at that location we have now stretched the spring enough that we are beginning to move point A. And so then point A starts to move like this. Okay. Let me set up a couple other dimensions on here as well. Okay. We know that the height here is one meter. We know that this is three meters. And then how far it moves over here, let me just call that D. All right. So how much has the spring stretched? Well, let me do it, let me do it this way. The, the amount of force is going to be equal to the spring constant, 35 newtons per meter multiplied by how much it stretches. How much it stretches is equal to the difference in the final length of the spring, okay? The final length of the spring is given with a square root of three meters plus D squared plus one meter squared, okay? That's the final length of the spring. How much it stretches uh, we get that by subtracting what its initial length was. Okay. All right. So that's how much force is being applied in the spring. Here's another thing that's a little tricky. Um, that direction of that force is something else that we need. Okay, I can do that with a slope, right? The slope that I get there is just given by one meter height over what? Three meters plus D. And D, again, is a variable that I'm trying to solve for. So that gives me the direction of that force. All right. Do I have all of my forces accounted for on the block? I'm missing a big one. 
a missing one that's kind of the point of the problem. Yeah, friction. Okay, and at this phase of the problem, it is before motion has started. Okay, not only that, it is actually right at the point in time where it is about to start. They call this motion impending, right? That's kind of the fancy word that people use that means it's right there at the threshold where it's about to break loose, right? That means that since it's right there at the threshold where it's about to break loose, the amount of reaction force isn't just, uh, you know, we can't, we don't just know that it reacts to the amount of horizontal force being applied. We actually know a value for it because it's right at the threshold where it's about to break loose, right? And so that allows me to say that this is going to be equal to my static coefficient of friction times F sub n, my normal force. All right. And there is my free body diagram. What do I do with the free body diagram? Well, I write, uh, you know, when I'm teaching statics, I'm used to saying I write equilibrium equations. That's actually not false for this one because it is quasi-static. This is kind of like an equilibrium equation. I can just sum forces. I'll start actually in the y direction. I have a good reason for this. Hopefully it'll become clear. Uh, momentarily. So I start in the y direction. Okay, what y components do I have? An easy one is Fn. Okay, another easy one is the amount of weight, which is uh, 98.1 newtons. Okay, all right, now one that's a little bit more tricky. Okay, minus the amount of force that I have here, which is 35. Newton per meter times square root of three meters plus D squared plus one meter squared minus over here. This just ends up being um, the square root of 10. meters, so I'll just, I'll abbreviate that, or I'll punch that, I'll, I'll express it like that to give myself a little bit more room. All right, now, I want just the component of this that acts in the y direction, okay? To do that, I multiply by the portion of the slope that goes in that direction, which is one meter, right? And I divide by the overall length of that uh, slope indicator triangle. Okay, so I'd go in here and I do this as a three meters plus D squared plus, okay, one meter squared. All right, and that gives it to me. So basically the, you know, the one meter over all of this stuff right here allows me to pick off just the vertical component of the overall spring force. And I can set this equal to zero. Okay, and before I do too much more with that expression, let me do another one in the X. Okay, in the x direction, I have minus, okay, what is my static coefficient of friction? 0.4, right? So minus 0.4 times F sub n, and I don't know what that value is yet, so I just have to put it in as a variable. All right, the only other component I have in the x direction is the x component of the spring force, right? So I add, all right, turns out, it's actually exactly like this, with one difference. Instead of one meter right here, what do I put right there? Okay. 
What I want to put there instead is the horizontal portion of this slope indicator, right? So I want to put in there um, 3 meters plus D. And this is equal to 0. Now, this expression, this, this equation that I just wrote here is very important, okay? because it goes in the x direction and once we actually start having some motion, the x direction is the direction the motion is going to occur, right? And so for that reason, I actually, I want to sort of keep this expression that the x one is more important to me than the y one. So what I'm gonna do is use the expression in the y and plug in, uh, I'm gonna basically try to get rid of my fn variable. I don't care what that variable is for any of the things I'm trying to answer, okay? So if I can eliminate it, that would be helpful. So what I'll do is I'll take this expression and I will solve it for Fn, okay? That's actually pretty easy because all I have to do is just basically move everything to the other side of the expression. Uh, let me just do it this way because this is easy. Okay, only things I have to change here are those two signs. Okay, and now that I have Fn solved in that way, I take Fn and plug it in here. All right, now you can believe me or you don't have to, um, that gets kind of messy to have to write all of that out, but one of the things that you'll see is that there are some common factors, right? So, for instance, there is a common factor in a couple of these terms of all of that stuff, right? So basically the 35 Newton per meter, the square root of 3m, 3 meters plus d squared plus 1 meter squared minus 10 meters all over that other square root, that's all a common factor for a couple of terms that are in here. And I can use that to basically simplify this down and I can uh, come up with an expression then that is like this. I have 35 Newton per meter times the square root of 3 meter plus D squared plus 1 meter squared minus the square root of 10 meters. All right. All over the square root of 3 meters plus D squared plus 1 meter squared. All right, this all needs to be multiplied by 3 meters plus D minus, okay, <clears throat> 0.4 times 1 meter. And this is all going to be equal to 0.4 times 98.1 newtons. One of the reasons it's important for me to write it that way is that if I don't, then when I try to take this single variable equation that I now have written that I can solve for D, and if I try to punch that in the calculator before doing that, I run out of space and the calculator won't actually take that many characters. All right, so now I've got it condensed to where it will uh, accept that many characters. Um, it is kind of cool to see the calculator solve this because it is kind of big and messy and it is, you know, but I'm going to spare you that. I'm gonna say you can punch this in the Casio and what you get is that D is going to be equal to 1.31633 meters. OK. 
okay? So part A is now done. How do I go to part B? Remember, part B is once it does start moving, right? Which it, once I get to this length is when I expect that it's going to start moving. Once it does start moving, what is the acceleration of block A? Okay, well, what do I have to do? Okay, keep in mind that I got this whole expression that I just solved based on a sum of forces in the x direction, correct? Right, so each of these terms that I have over here um, is a force that acts in the x direction. So if I collect them all again to, uh, to one side, that gives me the sum of forces that I have in the x direction. Now I also have a value of d that I can plug in there, okay? And the only other thing that I need to change is that once it actually starts to move, do I still need to use my static coefficient of friction or should I do something else? Okay, I should probably do something else. So this is part B that I have right here. What I'm gonna say here is that my acceleration, all right, along the surface, so I can, you know, I'll say actually this is my initial acceleration. That means right when it starts to move. Is gonna be based on this force, all right? I have to move my 0.4 times 98 um, I got to move that over to the other side of the expression again, so I subtract that. Okay. But what else? There's a couple other things I need to do to this expression to make this work to find my acceleration. Okay, right now I've got forces on the right. What do I need to do to make accelerations? Divide by mass, okay? So I can do that basically like this. This term I can divide by mass right here. And I can divide by mass on this one as well. Okay, the other thing I mentioned a second ago is my coefficient of friction. Once it starts to move, do I want 0.4? No, nope. what do I want instead? Okay, 0.25 is what I've given at the beginning of this problem as the kinetic coefficient of friction. All right, so I put in here 0.25. And where else do I put that? Right here. Okay, there's an expression that I can use. All I have to do is plug in D. Right, which if I do that, it gives me my initial acceleration is 1.622 meter per second squared. All right, and now the really cool part of the problem. The last part of the problem is, what is the velocity after the block has moved one meter? Okay. So let me go back up to the beginning up here and now that I know my D value of 1.3163 meters, let me go back up and show that in this picture. So D is equal to 1.3163 meters. Okay. And now what happens is because the block starts moving, this point starts progressing this way. And I want to give that a variable. Let me actually call that x. 
as in how far has that point for that block moved to the right. Okay, so my question is this, um, how long is the spring after the block has now moved X? Okay, and I would say that it should be the square root of, okay, this final length that I have, which is 3 plus 1.3163, okay, that gives me 4. That's, that's, let me put that in up here as well. So the total length from here to here is 4.1, or 0.3, 163 meters. Do you agree with that? All right, so I put in here 4.3163 meters um, minus x squared, then what? This is when the spring has now gone to um, this new location, right? This is Now that the block has started to slide a little bit, that's the length I'm trying to find right here. So I add what? One meter squared, okay? This is important because in this phase of the problem, we need to know how much force the spring is pulling with throughout that motion, okay? So keep that, that little expression right there in mind for the length of that spring. All right, for part C, I'm going to try to come up with an expression that gives me A in terms of X. Okay, what this is, is it's just going to be equal to my net force in the X as a function of X over 10 kilograms. Do you agree with that? Well, how do I come up with my net force in the x direction? My question is, is it any different than what I just came up with right here? And if it is different, how is it different? So keep in mind, what I came up with there is an acceleration when the spring was at full stretch. What's the only thing that changes now? The spring is now relaxing some, right? The spring is moving along as X increases because the, the block is moving to the right. So that's, you know, basically this right here is happening by some variable of X. The block is moving to the right. It's relaxing the spring. Most everything stays the same in this expression, okay? But the length uh, of stretch of the spring changes. And what that looks like is this. A of X is going to be equal to 35 Newton per meter times Remember, to get my stretch of the spring, I need to know the new length, and the new length of the spring is now 4.316 meters minus x squared plus one meter squared. Okay, minus the original length of the spring which was square root of 10 meters. Okay. And then I need to change that same thing in the denominator, right? 4.316 meters minus X squared 
plus one meter squared times, okay, here I've got 4.316 meters minus x minus 0.25 times one meter. And then lastly, I subtract 0.25 times 98.1 newtons over 10 kilograms. Okay, in all of these cases, let me, I'm gonna slide that to the next line. <clears throat> in all of these cases, all I'm doing is just using the same geometry that I came up with from my original free body diagram and I'm expressing uh, a net force in the x direction and then I divide by mass to get a net acceleration in the x direction. Once I have this acceleration in the x direction given as a function of x, what can I do with it? Let me show you. I'm going to have to go back and remember something that we derived early on, and it was this. Do you remember a formula that looked like this? The new velocity squared minus an original velocity squared. One half of this is equal to the integral from an original position to a final position of acceleration as a function of position d position. Okay, what do we now have in this expression that I have set up? Okay, this is, this expression I've got right here is a function of acceleration in terms of position. Okay. Do I have an initial velocity? The block starts, it starts out being stopped, right? So I have initial velocity of zero. I'm trying to come up with a final velocity of the block. And so the final velocity of the block is just the square root of two times, right, the integral from the initial position to the final position. What's our initial position? Zero. Of A of X DX. Is that something that the calculator can do really easily? Yes, all right. Uh, to make it work just a little bit better, I'm going to take a moment and store 4.316 into a variable. Okay, I'm gonna store that, let's just say, into uh, A. Okay, all right, that should help save me a little bit of space here. All right, so I'm gonna enter all this in here. Uh, I need a square root of two times an integral. And that integral is going to be of 35 times, okay. Um, in here, I'll have a square root of, okay, A, minus x squared plus 1. Okay, I don't need to square that. Um, minus square root of 10. All right. In the denominator, I have 10 
times the square root of <coughs> a minus x squared plus 1. All right. All of this gets multiplied by a minus x minus 0.25 times 1. I don't need to do that. Minus point two five times ninety eight point one over ten. All right. And what are my limits on this integration? Zero, two, what? It says the speed of the block when it has moved one meter. Right? And hopefully I entered all of that correctly. Okay, it turns out to be about 0.255. Okay, so I entered all of this expression into this V equation and the Casio rendered this to be V at the end is equal to 0.255 units meter per second. All right, can I answer any questions for anyone? We just went through a whole bunch, but if there's any, any place where you feel uh, shaky, I'd be happy to try to address it. All right, well, that's the idea of friction, so. I'll catch you all on the next lecture.